Welcome to Oplum Plaza Talks, created by the Hispanic Theological Initiative. Each episode focuses on a topic that matters to you, whether you're in the field, the academy, or the clergy. Today we bring you a conversation between Dr. Matthew Petway and Dr. Elias Ortega on Dr. Petway's new book, Cuban Literature in the Age of Black Insurrection. For more information about today's episode, please visit us at htiopenplaza.org. Hello, everyone. Welcome to HTI Open Plaza. I am Elias Ortega Aponte, and I serve as president of Meadville Lombard Theological School and professor of religion, ethics, and leadership. It is my pleasure today uh, to have with us Dr. Matthew Penway, who is assistant professor of Spanish at the University of South Alabama, where he also teaches in Africana studies. He, his work is marvelous and really fascinating, and I'm really excited to have this opportunity to speak with, with him and to introduce to you the work that he has done in this marvelous book uh, titled Cuban Literature in the Age of Black Insurrection, Manzano, Placido, and Afro-Latino Religion. Um, I, I think for, for all of us, uh, the opportunity to think uh, with a person as gifted as Matthew, right, who brings uh, a conversation on a moment in Caribbean history that is connected not only to the potential right, for uh, revolutionary change, but also an affirmation of Black dignity in this moment uh, is fill my heart with pride and also hope uh, for the moment and, and the work that we are doing uh, today as a scholarly community and as folks who also participate in social movements and in faith communities across the nation. So welcome, Matthew, and I'm looking forward for this conversation. So as a way to get us started, uh, please tell us a little bit about your intellectual genesis. Like, why do you do the work that you do in the ways in which you do it? Well, um, thank you for having me, Elias. I'm happy to be here uh, with the Hispanic uh, Theological Initiative. I think with regard to my work, there are a lot of different uh, events essentially that led me to where I am today. One thing my grandmother used to say um, that I didn't fully appreciate growing up in Detroit, uh, going to these African-American Protestant churches was, I know that I know that I know. Uh, she would always say these sorts of things. And she, even though she was uh, committed to Christianity, a particular uh, Church of God in Christ interpretation of Christianity, uh, she had a way of talking about this, the spiritual world that once I began to study Caribbean religions, I began to realize that her belief structure was in some way touched or influenced by or had, uh, I will call it more than residue, I'll say that it was African inflected on occasion. She would always talk about the ability of others to do harm. And she would use the word brujeria, but in English, right? Uh, so she had this awareness that she was navigating a, a spiritual landscape uh, that was wrought with danger and that uh, in addition to praying, she had to be able to be discerning and to identify where harm might, li might lie. Um, now, growing up, we thought, you know, she's overbearing <laughs> and, uh, you know, a little bit too religious. She would, in fact, she would actually, um, she would, she was a minister. She, she would teach uh, and preach at the house. So, you have to imagine growing up in, uh, in Detroit, we thought, man, when are we going to get an opportunity to leave the house and go to regular church like regular people? <laughs> we'll be Christian. Just let us go to church like regular people. And that was the sort of thing that um, grandmother had a different type of vision. Um, that was something that we grew up listening to her stories. We grew up listening to her, uh, her activities as a, an itinerant preacher of sorts. Uh, and I want to say the mid to late 20th century. And I think once I came to graduate school, um, my intent was to do something that would connect me to uh, people of African descent in Latin America. So I'd done the master's degree, but at the time, Michigan State University didn't have an apparatus in place for me to look at the Caribbean or Afro-Latin American populations. And so I studied what I could study. Once I decided to come back for the doctorate, um, I was introduced to Ada Ferrer's book, Insurgent Cuba. And I was struck, very well, very well argued, very well written. I was struck by the 
role that people of African descent had played in Cuba in the 19th century. I thought this is extraordinary. Uh, without Cubans of African descent, Cuba would have never acquired its independence. Overwhelmingly, the soldiers that fought in uh, the Cuban wars for independence, the three engagements ended in uh, uh, 1898, um, were of African descent, not only foot soldiers, but also people who uh, led, were generals like Antonio Maceo uh, and other members of his family. But I think when it comes to the project that became Cuban literature in the age of black insurrection, I initially really planned on doing an anti-racist critique uh, of 19th century Cuban society. And I was interested to what extent it might be possible to write a history of uh, black Latinx, you might say today, or Afro-Latinx thought in Cuba in the 19th century, you know, trajectory. I was interested in that. Uh, but I came to religion and spirituality in the process of reading Manzano's work, rereading his work after a trip to Cuba. And um, Cuba was the first time I came in uh, more, I would say, direct contact with uh, ritual priests. And um, my initial contact was... Uh, I, coming from a, a background that my father was a, was a convert to Islam, uh, who was born here in Mobile, Alabama, where I live. But my, my grandmother, you know, uh, was a Christian all her life. Once again, that Christianity that I now think was inflected with some African ideas of spirit and cosmos. And so I was nervous initially. I thought, what am I doing, you know, with this? And I would write about it in my journals. I think that the moment that my thinking began to shift uh, about African-inspired spirituality really came when I was in Ghana, not Cuba. Outside Accra, uh, I think we were in Cape Coast. We had gone to visit one of the slave dungeons on the coast. Uh, we went to Elmina, uh, which the Portuguese erected in the 1480s uh, after acquiring land through a series of agreements with the local rulers. And um, I stayed up the night prior. I had a, a roommate. We were staying in this hotel, and uh, he fell asleep. I stayed up the night prior, and I cried all night. And, uh, and I was crying for African Americans. I was crying for people of African descent that were pulled away from Africa. I felt the lost uh, in my bones for the first time. I don't even know how much sleep I got. So I thought the next day I would be fine. <laughs> Got to the slave dungeon the next day, and uh, I remember a gesture by a young Ghanaian man who offered tissue to one of my colleagues, a dear friend of mine, Sonia Maria Johnson. And I just kind of looked at her and I said, Sonia, he's offering you, and I started to cry again. <laughs> but it was a moving experience uh, for me, and I began to try to put myself in the shoes. Frankly impossible, whether you're African-American, Afro-Latinx, Latinx of indigenous descent, really impossible to put yourself entirely in the shoes of your ancestors. But we did a ceremony in remembrance of uh, the sovereign of the ocean sea, of, uh, of, uh, of the ocean, Yemaya. And in the process of doing that, I'm calling it a ceremony. I'm not sure if it was strictly a ritual. Um, it's when I began to, to imagine what things might have been like for an African woman uh, man or child, from their perspective, who would be their protector? And, uh, and so I began to think of Yemaya then as a protector to Africans who are being torn from their homes uh, to be bought and sold like chattel. You know, you are in good company. Uh, Manuel Zapata Oliveira, right, a, a Colombian writer, um, when he was working on his, uh, for many of us, his magnum opus, uh, Chango El, El Gran Putas, mm -hmm. uh, he actually narrated a very similar experience. Uh, he mm. couldn't quite finish the novel until he spent a night in, in one of the dungeons. And, and as, oh, as, my. He has this vision, right, of talking to, to ancestors. Uh, passing by, right, walking into, in, into the boats um, and talking with him. And after that, right, the novel uh, came into fruition. 
I think for, for many of us, right, that, that native spirituality, indigenous spirituality, ancestral work, right, is central to the work uh, that we do in our cosmology. And, and at mm-hmm. times, you know, we, we may speak about it openly, other times it's in the background, right, but, but it shapes the, the work that, that we do, right? It moves us intellectually to explore particular questions, right, particular figures, and, and kind of give us some insight, right, into some of the hidden gen of knowledge that is there, right, if we mm-hmm. only listen carefully. Um, I think something that I would love then for, for us uh, to have a conversation is the figures, right, that, that you discuss. Uh, Manzano mm-hmm. and Placido, for example, are, are two figures that when folks think of Caribbean literature, they don't oftentimes come to the fore, right, as uh, precursors, right, of this uh, uh, kind of Afro-Latinidad in, in thinking and articulating, right, a liberation is pro- project within, you know, the Black Caribbean. So if That's you right. can tell us a little bit about these figures, right, and your particular interest in it and, and how they actually start working, right, into, into your work. Um, I, I think that when most folks uh, who, who study, um, you know, Cuban literature or even I think even folks who look at Hispanophone Caribbean literature, they may think of some of the, the, the more famous figures like Nicolás Guillén, uh, Nancy Morejón, who really builds on Guillén's emphasis on African descended culture and does something extraordinary with it, with poems like Mujer Negra, Ojo de Legua, you know, the eyes of a Legua, who, who is the spirit of the crossroads, or Black Woman, the other poem. But, um, but what we don't often... We're never, we're never really taught that prior to Nicolás Guillén, that Nicolás Guillén eh, no surgió de la nada, que no es un poeta, que un día nació poeta y ya empezó a hacer la cosa y he changed the world. When I was coming in, when I was coming up, you could only find Guillén. And then, you know, in the anthologies, and then a little bit later you would find Morejón. Morejón was placed also there. But I wanted to get beyond this notion of the black writer as garnish, um, um, as a kind of a part of a broader assortment and to ask about the roots of Spanish American literature. How can we redefine Spanish American literature? I want to look at unlikely places and I also want to do work that would allow me to push past anti-racist critique. I wanted to do something, Elias, que nunca se había hecho antes. That was really important to me, something that had not been done before. Uh, so Juan Francisco Manzano is important for not only Cuban literature and Hispanophone Caribbean literature, but Spanish American and Latin American literature more broadly, because to our knowledge, he's the only person of African descent in Spanish America to write a slave narrative uh, himself, not a, as told to, but something that he authored himself. So it's very important for that reason. His slave narrative, uh, which was often known as La Autobiografía, became the foundation actually, for Cuban uh, narrative. And uh, there's authors, you know, prior to myself have made that point, like William Luis, in, in a very helpful way. Um, uh, but Juan Francisco Marzano was also important in addition to that because when you look at his work through a pluriversal prism, an inclusive prism, you begin to realize that in addition to Catholicism, there are African ideas of spirit and cosmos. Uh, he was born in uh, 1797, to the best of our knowledge, and died in 1853, apparently of natural causes. And uh, he first began to publish in um, 1821. So he publishes one of the first books of poetry, collections of poetry, Poemarios, in La Historia de Cuba. Es bien importante. Ante cualquier otro poeta está publicando ya Manzano. So that's really important. His contemporary Placido was born free. So I think of, for those who are not familiar with him, but are more familiar with the States, I tend to think of Juan Francisco Manzano as a Frederick, Cuban Frederick Douglass of sorts, though he published his slave narrative prior to Douglass um, in 1840 in England, in English translation, and Douglass publishes in 1845 his first of three narratives. Um, Placido then, for heuristic purposes, Placido would be something like Martin Delaney, because he was born free and lived his life out as a, as a free man. He was born in 1809. Uh, Placido was distinguished by his color almost immediately because his mother was um, a Spanish woman from Burgos, a northern part of Spain, a bit less touched by the African and Arab Muslim presence. Uh, <laughs> I've been to Burgos, interestingly enough. Uh, bien medieval la ciudad todavía. But... Uh, uh, <laughs> 
since you mentioned that, I'm going to ask you for, for the audience that you maybe you can say a little bit of kind of the, the notion of castas, right? And how that oh. kind of influences the kind of the kind of discussion of race in the Caribbean. Because for, mm-hmm. for, for some folks, right, it's it's complicated, right, to, to see the way in which whitening whitening right embeds itself so hard, right? In, mm-hmm. Uh, Spanish American, uh, Latin American, Russian categories in which you always push in against blackness, right? In very that's right, in that's right. Ways. That, that's right. And the Caribbean specifically, um, some have argued uh, that if, without talking about the Indo Caribbean population, if, if you put aside the Indian East Indian population for for a moment, and you have the discussion that the debate is largely about black versus white, uh, but Spanish American racial categories didn't construct race in dichotomous terms as was in the United States. So uh, we would have to go back very far to identify the whole notion of a black blood or white blood. We know that race is not a biological reality, that it is a social construct, which means it's a human invention and something that, you know, that was created essentially, we can look to uh, the late 15th century in Iberia, what would become Spain. We can look at the Limpieza de Sangre statues or purity of blood statues uh, that initially did not talk about black blood or white blood, but instead Jewish blood, as if such a thing exists. No existe esa cosa, tal cosa no puede existir. And uh, Muslim blood. And so uh, what I like to explain to my students is that the Catholics were largely, uh, not exclusively, but they were largely people that today will be identified as white. And once the Catholics defeat uh, the last Africans and Arabs in Granada, they arrive in the New World, uh, what became the New World, I should say, as conquerors. And that limpieza de sangre statue comes with them. Those laws come with them. Uh, But the language of black and white begins to take form uh, with the enslavement of Africans and the attempts to enslave the semi-servitude of indigenous people as well. So in the Caribbean, you have to think in terms of gradations rather than dichotomy, uh, understanding that an intermediate level existed, uh, the possibility of being something other than black, even if you're a person of African descent. So one, if one could claim a European ancestor, say, ah, mi abuelo fue español, todo el mundo dice eso, ah, mi abuelo fue español. Uh, maybe everybody else in the family is, a, is of African descent, but mi abuelo. Or, as is more common, la abuela, que la abuela se quedó, sí, mi, mi abuela se quedó, mi abuela se queda en la cocina. Um, so essentially what Placio was dealing with is that he was considered al parecer blanco. He was white in appearance at birth. And I use that language in the book in order to highlight the fact that um, he was considered white in appearance, but he was a person who was raised within communities of African descent, according to his biographers, by his black grandmother, who, according to one of my sources, uh, claims it was a formerly enslaved person. Very likely. His father was considered uh, the one-fourth African, or to be a quad- quadroon, essentially. Um, but um, Placido identified with African uh, inspired culture. He went to carnival. He was in, uh, involved at the Fiesta de Santos or the Saints Feast Days, uh, which were very Africanized within black communities. Um, and he identified politically against the notion that the mulatto should become white. Tell us a bit more about that. Well, Placio has a, a number of poems that, uh, that lampoon essentially this mulatto desire to become white. Uh, and so in the, not only Spanish Caribbean, but in the Spanish American system, in terms of these gradations, what individuals are encouraged to do is to make an effort to become uh, whiter and whiter. So you're looking for a partner uh, that will guarantee that your children will be a little less brown. Um, and Placido didn't do that. Placido uh, fell in love with a uh, beautiful black woman named Rafaela, who he named Fela, who died, unfortunately, in an epidemic, a cholera epidemic. It might sound very familiar. Um, And later, when she passed, you know, his wife was also a black woman. I found in the record a reference. uh, We can't identify exactly who said it, but a reference to the fact that one of the reasons why he was resented is that he did not identify uh, with his European ancestry. 
uh, even though he had a relationship with his mother in the way that uh, he was expected to. So, so Placido uh, has these poems where he makes fun of the so-called mulatto who wants to straighten his hair uh, or in spite of his weighty hair, perhaps in spite of his nose and his other features, claims to be white in plain view of everyone. Um, and he says, you know, he has a poem called Si Arcino Dices, you know, you, you can't, you know, essentially you can't throw rocks, you know, uh, when your house is made of glass. <laughs> that's, that's, that's really good. <laughs> and it's true, and, you know, and it, it has been a trope of conversation right, around uh, um, the Afrocentric um, literature in the, in the Caribbean, right? That conversation on the cost of whitening, right? And trying to be adopted into, into a white culture, right? As a, as a political project and the counter-political project of, of resistance. I think something uh, in, in, in your book that you, you really uh, write eloquently about is the crossroads, right? And the way in which your, your poets articulate, right? That moment of what does it mean both in terms of co uh, cosmology, right? But also mm -hmm. ethics and politics would be at that um, crossroad. And you also make some connections, right? With, with the blues in, in the United States, the Delta blues and Robert Johnson. Uh, and I wonder if you can tell us more, more about that. And what are you finding that in, in that particular process of thinking through the crossroad? Absolutely. I think the crossroads as a concept is extraordinarily important. One thing I would add with reference to what I was saying about race is that blackness was constructed at the nadir of degradation, the lowest point imaginable. Uh, so the flight from blackness was essentially uh, what was uh, incentivized in Spanish Caribbean society. And the law incentivized it in some important ways. So an individual could not, be, not study at a university if they were of uh, known African ancestry, could not become a priest. Uh, they could not become a college professor. There were only certain professions they could uh, exercise. They had to carry freedom papers with them, those sorts of things. And so the escape from blackness, the flight from blackness, the ability to claim something other than black was incredibly incentivized. Um, to talk about the crossroads, which is a, one of the central concepts of Cuban literature in the age of black insurrection, I like to define terms that I typically think of la encrucijada, básicamente, la encrucijada, no, as a... Um, the cro or the crossroads as a spirit that governs the meeting of disparate worlds, um, that the crossroads links spirit, spirit with flesh. Uh, it links divine power with human need, divine power with human need. So with regard to the concept of the crossroads, we're not speaking about uh, within a Judeo-Christian framework where one would say, okay, Yo voy a pedir a Dios que me, que me, que me, eh, bueno, uh, that he saves me, right? Que me redima. No, uh, the concept of the crossroads cannot be equated with the Judeo-Christian notion of redemption, particularly in Spanish uh, American society because Catholic theology uh, that was in operation was a slave theology. Uh, and if we go back to the 15th century, we see very briefly that that slave theology uh, had the imprimatur of the church. Uh, and so people of African descent, I, I wager, I theorize essentially, were looking for a way to access power that might liberate themselves. Um, the Yoruba, uh, the Yoruba speaking ethnicities in West Central Africa uh, are imported to Cuba, particularly the late 18th century. We see after... Uh, the British siege of Havana, and after the collapse of the Kingdom of Oyo uh, in what is today Nigeria, we see large numbers of the of Yoruba speaking African ethnicities uh, brought to Cuba against their will. And there, the, the notion of the spirit of the crossroads, or a shu, also known as a legua, and Haitian will do legba. In Cuba, a legua, a chu, or a legua, uh, I refer to them typically as a legua. Um, is a, is a spirit that is, unlike Christianity, uh, ambivalent, but not evil. And so the dichotomy of good and evil uh, also doesn't exist in quite the same way within what we might call an African-Cuban moral universe. Um, also at the cross was another thing that was important for Manzano. So um, Manzano was... Uh, 
uh, essentially looking to escape slavery circa 1817, somewhere around 1817, so that he could arrive in Havana. And he's looking to do so because he's been charged by his mother to acquire his own freedom. And uh, once he acquires his own freedom to become a father to his siblings. Now, all this is after his own father has passed away. This was really moving to me uh, to read this and to, and to be able to write about this. Uh, so Mansado, I would say, was at the crossroads on at least four different occasions in his life. And this is just according to the record, right? So if the crossroads is that spiritual entity that governs the meeting of disparate worlds uh, and requires the individual when the road bifurcates to make a decision, uh, Manzano had to make such a decision on his escape to Havana on horseback in 1817. He had to make that, uh, he was at the, found himself at the crossroads again in 1838. Uh, uh, his mother had asked him to become a father to his siblings. And in order to become a father to his siblings, he needed to use the money that his family had, his inheritance, to purchase his freedom. Well, he wasn't able to do that because the mistress or the enslaver took that. She took that money from him. And so then he escapes on horseback, uh, presumably one of the horses his family owned, actually, to Havana. Uh, in 1838, then, he's still in the process of trying to free his brother. And he publishes this poem called Un Sueño a Mi Segundo Hermano. I, I believe, though it's a little difficult to demonstrate because the historical record is spotty, right? Somewhat fragmented. That he's doing so uh, because he wants to raise funds to liberate his brother. We don't know what happened, essentially, with that, uh, that project. But in 1839, he meets a dynamic young African-descended poet who, by that time, has already become perhaps the most famous person of African descent in Cuba, and that's Palacio. So in 1839, he's at the crossroads once again uh, because he has an opportunity for aesthetic, aesthetic collaboration, excuse me, aesthetic collaboration with Placido. Um, and finally, Manzano found himself at the crossroads in 1844 uh, when the choice was either to join an anti-slavery movement that had as, as its objectives the abolition of slavery um, and possibly uh, the, cons the, uh, the, the idea of erecting or constructing a government of blacks and mulattoes on the island or African descendants on the island. Uh, so he had to decide, would he swear the oath or would he abjure the oath? Um, so all of this I find, I found this absolutely extraordinary to look at. Imagínate tú, Manzano's engaging the, uh, Manzano's engaging the saints, essentially, right? Uh, so in the saints, in Catholicism, are, the, yeah, they open the way. The saints are the intermediaries uh, between God and man. One can say a prayer to San Antonio, for example. So of all the saints that Manzano mentions in his, in his book, he mentions the saint that has been transculturated or um, parallel, is parallel with the spirit of the crossroads. And that's San Antonio, who's parallel with El Egua in the, uh, in the Cuban tradition. So his understanding of the saints, para mí, la verdad que era muy interesante, la manera en la cual él piensa y comunica con los santos, because the saints reward devotion uh, and punish neglect for Manzano. There's a principle of reciprocity there. Um, uh, and what was so interesting is that African cosmologies pose a challenge to the logic of European philosophy because European philosophy is based on the principle of non-contradiction. So Masano could engage this uh, African spirit of the crossroads and at the same time as he did go to mass, be baptized in the church, marry in the church and receive the last rites when he died. Uh, so, so Matthew, thank you for that really rich conversation and thinking through the crossroad and put it in the context of, of a life of an author, where right? the decisions that he's making as he's thinking about, you know, his poetic with an intention, right, to, to, to free his brother, right, to create a new consciousness of, of his own experience. Um, and I wonder if it, if it would be possible for you to share, right, a little bit of uh, one of his poems with us, right, for us to, to get a flavor, right, of, of, of Manzano's poetics. Absolutely. Uh, I'm going to share a sonnet that Manzano published in 1837 called 30 Años. Uh, primero voy a leer el soneta en español, uh, no demasiado rápido, y después una traducción que hice. Um, 
Cuando miro al espacio que he corrido, desde la cuna hasta el presente día, tiemblo y saludo la fortuna mía, más de terror que de atención movido. Sorpréndeme la lucha que he podido sostener contra suerte tan empía, si tal puede llamarse la porfía de mi infeliz ser al mal nacido. Treinta años ha que conocí la tierra, Treinta años ha que en gemido estado, triste infortunio por doquier me asalta, mas nada es para mí la cruda guerra, que en vano suspera he soportado, si la calculo, oh Dios, con la que falta. Thirty years, Juan Francisco Manzano. When I gaze upon the course I have run, since infancy to the present day, I tremble and meet my destiny. Troubled more by terror than by contemplation. Astonished by the struggle that I have endured against such an ungodly fate, if I may name the quarrel thus of my ill-fated soul of lowly birth. Thirty years I have known this planet. Thirty years since, in a state of lament, miserable misfortune assails me from all sides. But nothing is like the cruel war I have fought yearning in vain if I compare it with what is to come. Thank you. You know, Thank you for that. Uh, I think it's fascinating for, for us to, to hear, right, the, the particular ways in which uh, the experience right, is, is narrated right, for, for the moment, uh, right, in making sense of, of, of where he is, right, as a person, but also where he hopes to go. Mm -hmm. in, in this book, right, there, there's so much richness for us to think about. And one of, one of the concerns that, that I think uh, at times happens in, in the general public is that uh, they wonder why do we study these moments that seem so obscure, right, in, in the imagination of people. But, but I think you can, you can actually tell us, right, what is the importance, right, the significance uh, of thinking, right, of 19th mm. century Cuba in mm. this particular Right, black freedom str struggle in in, 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 a, in a nation, right, in the Caribbean, that is also connected globally to all the parts of not only in Europe but also in the United States, right, in, in emerging nations, right, this, this particular consciousness. And I wonder, right, in, in your uh, uh, way of thinking this project, right, and now that you have laid it down and you're seeing, the, you know, the world as a published book, uh, what is the significance that you are seeing, right, in, in the questions that you were asking than of 19th century Cuba in this particular figures that you can see in this particular contemporary moment in which we are now? Mm -hmm. I appreciate the question. I think that uh, when we think about the birth of, particularly here in the United States, when we think about the birth of um, the Americas, we think about the United States, though we know that it wasn't really until the 17th century that you have a permanent English settlement in Jamestown. Well, prior to the permanent English settlement in Jamestown, almost a century prior, uh, actually more than that, you have Africans being brought to the Caribbean against their will. So prior to the conquest of Mexico, uh, the invasion of Mexico, 1519, the conquest of Mexico, the, of the Mexica by Cortes, you have Velazquez, right, in Cuba. Uh, so really the Caribbean is really the first crucible for the construction of what a racialized society will look like in the modern era. And so I tend to think about slave societies, uh, not as a relic of a bygone barbaric past, but I think of them as an archaic authoritarian regime that doesn't require much subterfuge to legitimate its power, right? Slave societies don't make a pretense to universal individual rights like our societies do. Um, slave societies die, but they do not decompose. Slave societies die, but they don't decompose. So even though we had the abolition of slavery in the United States in 1865, and then later we had a constitutional amendment uh, to abolish it, we know that amendment, the 13th Amendment, has that loophole, right? And Cuba is 1886 that slavery is abolished uh, because of that war that African descendants fought, that war for those wars for independence, right? And Brazil is 1888. But former slave societies forsake one framework of legitimacy for another. They substitute one technology of power for another. Um, the same articles of faith endure in spite of that. The belief in racial hierarchy, a doctrine of rape, white supremacy, and an unquenchable thirst for labor that can be exploited and is therefore uh, disposable. Slave societies require silence as a staple of the rhetorical diet 
Um, social positions are considered divinely ordained. Uh, education is a luxury of the choice few. Critical thinking, I like to remind myself that critical thinking is anathema uh, to social cohesion within slave societies. Critical thinking is the last thing that an authoritarian regime wants to do. And what does the authoritarian regime do? Uh, what, what does the authoritarian regime do? It makes a mockery of local rule. Your, the election of your mayor doesn't matter. So I think about my home state and I think about the former uh, regime there. Uh, not the current governor, but the former regime there where Flint and even my own city, Detroit, uh, didn't have local rule. So that means it didn't have, there was no democracy there in these cities that are largely of African descent. And so I think for ourselves, as we look back, our, the crossroads that we find ourselves at, and this is how I see it, others may see it somewhat differently, but I think that we are, we have two choices. The road, once again, is bifurcating and it's either going to be, uh, anti-racist democracy or authoritarianism. I don't think that we have middle ground. Um, and so we find ourselves in a position where we need broad-based um, uh, solidarity among members of the global majority, whether you're talking about indigenous peoples fighting to keep pipelines off their lands, whether you're talking about African-American communities uh, fighting uh, extrajudicial violence or violence sanctioned by the state. Are you talking about Latinx people concerned with uh, Central Americans being locked um, locked in, in cages, quite frankly? I mean, all these things respond, to my mind, to the logic of an archaic authoritarian regime of slave society, that this society in some way seems to be uh, tossing aside uh, the pretense to universal rights. And um, we got to fight like hell. Yeah. Yes, yes, we do. And, and I wonder, you know, what, what is the role of the poet, right, in, in this moment, right? Mm -hmm. the, the poet and the intellectual and, and those who speak, right, the general public to, to uncover, right, uh, that reality and put it in a way that is succinctly, right, in, in front of us, right, so that we don't, don't forget of the moment, right, and, and leave into, into the experience of the crossroad uh, with, with a passion, right, for, for a different mm -hmm. future. For a different future. Thank you, thank you, Matthew. I think this has been a very rich conversation, and there are so many other things that I would, would love to ask you. <laughs> but we have an opportunity, right, in, in the near future, right, to continue to continue this conversation. Um, and for the folks in, in HTI and Open Plaza, there's been a conversation with uh, Matt Petway, uh, who is the author right, of Cuban literature in the age of Black insurrection, Manzano Placido and Afro-Latino religions. And this book is part of the Caribbean Studies Series at the University of Mississippi Press, University Press of Mississippi, and is already available for purchase. Uh, thank you so much for tuning in, and I hope that you all continue to be safe during these times. Thank you, Elias. This has been an HTI production. For more information, visit us at htiopenplaza.org. The Hispanic Theological Initiative provides Open Plaza as a public service. The views expressed by the guests are their own. Their appearance on this program or any reference to a specific product or entity they represent does not constitute an endorsement or recommendation by HTI.